Hi folks, Thomas Henson here with thomashenson.com and today I wanted to do a video where we were kind of revisiting this topic that has been up a couple different times around C++ and C++ being only for deep learning or is it never, right? So I've got a couple videos that are out there but the comments are really kind of heating up and I really want to talk about you know what I've what I've been seeing in some of the comments right like hey it's only C++ for deep learning so I want to dive into that and talk about kind of the framework and kind of how you can kind of approach these because I, I really think that it's hard to make a blanket statement where hey only this language is ever used or you know any kind of definitive where this is never being used right um, so like we will never travel to Mars right we're, we're gonna be there so I thought you know it'd be good to kind of break it down and honestly I'm trying a new video format too so let me know how you like that as well so let's jump in and talk around C++ and why it's the only language for deep learning or is it so the question is, is all deep learning just C++? Are you wasting your time by learning Python, right? Is Python only for, I don't even understand the comment, right? Is it, is it only for just tutorials? And, you know, should you focus your attention only on C++ because that's the only thing that's in production? My thought process around that is we probably never want to make generalized statements saying, you know, this this language can never be used for anything because one, it's hard, right? There's so many different use cases, especially when we're talking about programming languages, right? Like there's not one way to do any one thing in programming, probably even in life, but this is a programming channel. So my thought was we would walk through a couple of comments around that and really just a framework. So I got some tips and really kind of how I want to break down the discussion. So first I want to take and let's do a language hierarchy. Let's talk about taking back from my experience with Java and Pig, how all that kind of maps out and really where the hierarchy is to understand why in reality, you know, you may be using Python, but you may be really writing C++, you, you just don't know it, right? Or maybe that's the way the code gets transposed. So we'll jump into that. Next, I want to go over some just public references, right? Let's go over what TensorFlow has on their website around customers, around, you know, organizations that are implementing TensorFlow in their code. And then also, I mean, you can see this at conferences too. So, you know, knowing, knowing that we're in a state where we can't travel and go to conferences, but there's a lot of virtual ones. We can take some of those references and look at it. That way it's not, Hey, we're just believing this, you know, random big data, big questions guy off the internet around his thoughts around C++. And then lastly, I want to cover what we always want to talk about is, you know, what approach did you take, right? If you're looking at this and you're saying, hey, wait a minute, should I use C++ or should that be something I focus on? Should I use that language? And, you know, how would you approach that? You know, and I, so I'll give you a framework of how I kind of approach those questions. And that's the best I can do, right? Like every, everybody's situation is going to be different. And so your focus and how you want to attack that. But I'll just share some of my thoughts and what I've seen from my experience. So, but before we jump into that, I did... I did want some comments. Do you like the new format? I thought maybe doing some different angles, you can see some different things in my office and really just trying to make it a more interactive, uh, fun uh, video too. So um, thanks everybody for tuning in, but let's go jump into talk around language hierarchy. Bonus points here for me getting on the whiteboard out in the home gym. So let's talk a little bit around language hierarchy. I'm here with my garage gym, whiteboard, you may have seen it in some other videos, but just bear with me, I think this is a good point here. So we know, if you've heard of the term built on the shoulders of giants, we use it a lot in the programming um, area around, there are different levels of language within your programming structure, right? So for example, in the Hadoop industry, you know, one of the things I always talked about was Java, right? And so I actually wrote a lot of my jobs in Pig, which was a higher level language. But in reality, the code that actually goes to the com computer and is compiled to make the decisions is non-human readable. You know, we call it binary code. So you can write your jobs in Java, right? And you have more control to do that. And that's, that's the way you can emulate it. But PIG was created 
to give more folks access to, right? So that you could turn more data analytics or more folks that had skills that were SQL and they didn't have to learn and they didn't have to write everything in Java. So it was a higher level language. So theoretically, not even theoretically, but you could write your MapReduce job in Java, but you could also write it in Pig. Now with anything, right, it's built on this binary code, right? So it, it's a way to write the code and make it easier. Now, anytime you do this, so not only the ease of use, so writing in binary, darn near hard, right? Like, you know, probably the, you know, the, hard, the hardest thing there. As you move up, Java, not, not so bad. You've got your compiler, the JVM, a lot of things to learn, a lot more libraries you can bring in, but it makes it all easier. And then PIG, higher level language, a lot easier, more folks can actually use it. So, but with each one of those layers, you're giving up control, right? You know, think of think of binary or the lowest level language means you can do it, you can you can have so much more control. It's a lot harder, you might have to write more lines of code to be able to do it, but you have full control. It's just it's just really hard. Same thing as you move up into the stack, right? There, there's a lot of fun, a lot of things that I couldn't do in pig that maybe I didn't, you know, maybe I needed to actually write it in Java, right? But you know, really whenever you're looking at a language, and, and even APIs kind of cover this too, you know, when we talk about frameworks or APIs, it gives you the ability so you don't have to write as much code in it. Um, and then sometimes there's some one-off functions or maybe not even one-off function, but a couple edge cases where you need to use and go down and use Java for those instances. But if you can cover about 80% of the requirements, then most of the time you're, you're, you're cutting your developer's work so you can hire more folks that can maybe learn pig and a few people that have to be able to write Java because it's kind of hard. Switching over to our discussion around deep learning. So let's just assume for this conversation that C++ is the only thing that there's no Java um, frameworks out there for deep learning, which is false. But we, we'll talk about that, maybe cover that in another video with an interview. But here's the same kind of approach, right? So everything is in binary for the most part. We'll just say that's the bottom level language. Um, and then C++, so you can do your deep learning here with C++, and then Python is written on top of it. So, if Java was out of the picture, which we're saying for this comment, then those comments are true that, you know, all things in production are in C++. Now, the programmer doesn't have to write it, right? Because Python can, your code can be written in Python and then it's transposed, written on top of C++, which is then gonna turn it into binary, and then it gets executed. So. I think what we're seeing here is there's some nuances to it. But let's jump on and let's go and actually look and see what TensorFlow and folks at TensorFlow conferences are saying about how they write their deep learning programs. All right, so point number two that we wanted to talk about was public references and conference videos. So I'm gonna go here to TensorFlow's website and you can go to the about TensorFlow section and you can see all the different, you know, reasons that folks use TensorFlow also in the case study. So think of this as like TensorFlow's sales page, right? Not sure what they're really selling. Maybe I should have done a little more research around that, but I do know that you can find case studies there. Quite a few case studies. So you can see some on Airbnb. One in particular, there's one on Coca-Cola and Google. Obviously, Google, um, <laughs> big contributor of TensorFlow, uh, really was behind open sourcing it. But let's jump to the GE Healthcare one. So you can go through this and I encourage you to read this. It's also good just to know kind of what your peers and other organizations are doing with deep learning or just anything that you're involved in, right? Like if you, you could be watching this channel and you are a DevOps person, right? Um, go find, you know, on Docker's page or Kubernetes or anywhere out there, go to, you know, the whole reason you go to conferences, right? Find out what other folks in the organizations are doing. In this one, GE talks about how they use TensorFlow for MRI brain scans, right? So using neural networks, I think it was, uh, they use some C, a CNN for image detection on brain scan images. So I, th I think that can, you know, really talk about and <laughs> stand the test of time for, applications in production that would be using maybe Python, right? So um, just another example there. And then just go out there and look at some of the stats to so go to GitHub or some of the other places. But I did want to pull and give you some more numbers. So TensorFlow has about over 1800 
different contributors, right? It's a lot of folks, you know, in, involved in the TensorFlow community. I know there's C++ in it too, but I'm just saying, not everybody's doing C++ there. I would say a majority of the folks are doing Python. Uh, PyTorch, over 900 plus, with I think over 100 core contributors uh, worldwide. Um, Cafe 2, uh, you know, large community there, you know, it's merged a little bit with uh, PyTorch as well. So that, another another area to kind of look at to, to find out, okay, you know, everything can't be C++. So <laughs> let's go on to our third point. All right, so last point we want to talk about is, all right, went through the architecture, we talked about the differences between just language hierarchy, binary, Java or C++, and then TensorFlow, Pig, other high level languages, right? But really the question comes down to not only how those languages work, but also what are some case studies, what are folks in the community and other organizations using? Went through the About TensorFlow page and also talked about the number of contributors uh, in TensorFlow and also in PyTorch. Last question is, what does that mean to you? So just like most problems in uh, computer science or IT, you know, it's going to depend. So what does that mean to you? Should you learn C++? Should you, should you learn Python? How, how should you consume? Or even like, how are you going to apply this to your applications, right? Like, are you, you know, you got a, you've got a project coming up or you're going to recommend C++, you're going to recommend Py, you know, using Python. I think it's all, it's all gonna depend, not I think. I know it's all gonna depend. You know, what are you looking at from a project perspective and how you kinda wanna tackle it, right? So it's not so much about uh, Thomas Henson from Big Data Big Question says that we should always use C++ or we should always use Python or anybody else, you know, anybody on anywhere, right? Like that's a decision you should make and you should do your research and bring that to the table when your team is having discussions about choosing different frameworks, you know, no different than if you're a web developer and you know if you're wanting to use uh, Node.js versus jQuery, I'm, I don't know if jQuery is still a thing anymore. So, but it was when, when when I was there. So, I've got a couple of tips for how I approach. So, wrote down a little bit around you know what are the three things that I do whenever I'm evaluating. You know, should I go this direction? Should I use this pro you know use this programming language? Um, so first, you know, talk about it from the perspective of, is this going to solve the project's problems, right? Like, am I using Python or am I using C++ for deep learning because the project needs this, right? Do you need more control? Do you need to go to a lower level language, right? Does your team have the right skills, right? We're not, we're not choosing it because it's hot and sexy and it's something that you want to go after. You really need to choose it because that's what the project is, right? Like you can get stuck. Like I used to do this <laughs> so much. And so, so don't go through this door. I'm telling you, you know, this is, <laughs> this was my approach. Like I would try to use new frameworks just because I thought it was fun. They were new and everybody wants, you know, something new and hot to, to, to kind of use, but that's not always the case, especially, you know, I mean, you know, the, when, when you look at the time value, how much time it's going to take to learn it, spin it up and then, you know, possible bugs and issues like that. Right. So choose it because it's for the project, not because it's something new and cool or something that you saw from somebody on uh, <laughs> YouTube. Um, second, uh, look at your career outlook. So even if you're evaluating it for a project, just in, in your organization, uh, what are, what are, what are the career up look, look like, right? You know, what are the career outlooks? Is it something like cobalt that, that maybe, maybe there's not as much career outlook for, I don't know. I've, I've heard, you know, there's, there's a rising of it, but ADA, right? You know, think of an old program language and kind of insert that. So, um, that's drastic to look at, but you can. You can kind of see and understand, you know, how vibrant is the community, you know, what's what's the activity level, even kind of doing some descriptions around looking, you know, looking at what most programming, lang you know, popular programming languages or frameworks are. A ton of stats on Indeed and a lot of blogs, you know, from these career sites, really, that, that'll kind of keep you on track. And then third, and and this kind of breaks my a little bit of my point, but is it fun, right? You know, um, so you know, I did say don't over rotate and go with something just because it's hot and sexy and new, but it also needs to be something that's fun. Otherwise, you won't jump into it too. So you know, strike that balance for 
is this right for the project? Is it the right tools? Is it gonna you know, do the things that we need to get by for this project? Or is it something that I'm learning you know, because there's a great career outlook to it, but also make sure it's fun. And you know, that can, that can be something as easy as saying, hey, you know, I like more programming, you know, I'm gonna stick more to data engineering and software development versus doing data science because data science is really popular and you know, at one point it was the sexiest job um, out there. So have fun with it, go, you know, go, go to your strengths, but make sure you're doing it and you have some data to, to back it up. So that's all I have for today. I hope this clears up the, you know, discussion around C++ versus Python in the deep learning world. I'm sure if it didn't, I will get more comments. You can put those in the comment section here below. And then also too, you know, if this is, you know, if you've watched quite a few of my videos or even if this is your first one, let me know how you like this video format. Um, it's the very first time I've, you know, didn't trying to do some of these jump scenes and some of the other things. And so really kind of sh trying to shoot it like it was, you know, just going throughout my day, right? So definitely wanted to give everybody some different views of the office and outside the office and even the gym, right? <laughs> the garage gym. So uh, try to get on the whiteboard a little bit. So thanks everybody again. Uh, make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode of Big Data, Big Questions, and I'll see you 